I'm a GP full-time in uh, Bacchus Marsh. Uh, for those who don't know, it's halfway to Ballarat, but as, as Nathan said, it's the centre of the universe. Um, I've been there for uh, uh, 28 years um, and uh, seen the place change and grow. Um, run my own practice. We've got nine GPs in our practice. So um, it's, I suppose we all got different backgrounds. We all come from different sorts of practices and that's the thing we've tried to uh, uh, cover tonight is all the different sort of types of GP that we are. Um, so we've done that bit about who's in the room now. Um, in the past, we used to go to the travel agent um, to uh, book our holidays. We used to line up at the bank to withdraw cash, write checks. The department store was, you know, your full, full uh, one-stop shop where you bought everything, everything existed in, the, in there, but now people do so online. Seeing the tax agent, um, you got it more completed physically, now a lot of it's done online. And if you needed company, you're used to go and see a matchmaker. These days it's done through online services. What about health information? So, you know, we, we have a number of different scenarios that people like to look at and try to imagine how, um, how things would be different if we had some way of sharing our health information in real time and at the time we need it. So what about if you have a friend or relative uh, who is suddenly taken ill and is in an emergency department, they ring you in the middle of the night and uh, say, um, uh, you know, they're confused, they're in hospital, um, they've got your number, and then they say, I've got to go, the doctor's there. And you think, well, how could I help this person provide them with information? Um, another little scenario that I had the other day with my health record was uh, um, a, uh, a patient of mine who, this is where I've, you know, I've had the my health record myself uh, for six years. I was one of the early users and early adopters uh, when it was back in the days of the PCEHR. Um, and it's only just starting to get useful, I think. And, and when we move to this new system of more people being involved, we may start to find that there's information there. One of the problems at the moment is people aren't using it, therefore there's nothing to look for, and therefore people look and then they get cheesed off and then they stop using it. Um, but I had a lady, young lady the other day who came in very agitated, uh, last patient, um, so quarter to eight on a Thursday night, uh, and she was pacing the uh, waiting room and then she came in and, uh, and she said, uh, I'm really anxious, I'm, I, I need some Valium. And we all get that sinking feeling, don't we? Last patient in the evening after Valium and you think, oh, here we go, a drug seeker. And she said, no, look, I really only ever come to this practice. Yeah, sure, I've heard all that before. Um, it really is true. And then she said, oh, by the way, look, I have a My Health record. And I thought, oh, well. That's, that's unusual for a drug seeker. Um, so I said, do you mind if I have a look? All right, we had a look. And sure enough, the last time she had Valium was uh, a very small uh, course of 10 tablets when she had a severe anxiety reaction um, earlier this year. And it was dispensed from our practice and nowhere else. So that sort of really opened up the trust again um, where it had been I'd been losing trust in you know, the typical drug seeking behavior. Um, so I think we all can find that there may be uses that we hadn't expected. Of course, that's going to change shortly too with safe scripts, which is another thing we'll talk about short in, as we go along. So consumers, also known to us as patients, um, but this is, uh, you know, partly you get stuck in the bureau speak and so we've got consumers and healthcare providers. So what do they want? They say that they want an improved experience convenience of accessing information uh, when it's convenient to them. They want to access and control their own health information and they want to be able to share the information and receive information from their healthcare providers, their doctors, their hospitals, their pathology results. Um, in uh, the US, there's been studies that suggest that 60% of Americans feel comfortable sharing health data with Google. Um, now, that's an interesting 
uh, assessment. 22% um, of Australians share information from wearable technology um, and mobile apps with their GP. How many people here have looked at patients' data that they brought in with them? Yeah? On their phone? Yeah? On their tracking device? Or old-fashioned paper, you know? They've, we've been sharing information for years. I get patients to record their blood pressures and bring them in regularly uh, on you know, home machines. So healthcare providers, that's us. We're, we're in that group. Um, what we want is more efficient use of e-health technology in healthcare, easier access to relevant information, the ability to improve productivity and improve practice efficiency. Um, the, uh, this is information that's derived from the uh, survey that the College of GPs, we do every year, um, a, a technology survey, and if you're interested in participating, it starts at uh, GP18, and you'll receive it in the uh, various communications that you get from the college. Uh, and we use that information. Last year, I think we had something like 1,700 uh, respondents. And uh, these were the findings that GPs believe that e-health technology could potentially improve practice efficiency, collaboration with other providers, and continuity of care. They also, GPs acknowledge there are a number of opportunities for greater use, um, such as generating electronic referrals better, using patient in real time clinical decision making, such as with uh, decision support, and communicating more effectively with other providers using electronic means. How many people here use electronic communications to write referrals? Argus or HealthLink or ReferralNet? Hands up, yeah? How many know that they receive it that way? Yep, so there's a lot more people receiving than sending. So we, we're trying to move towards this new world where we can send and receive stuff a bit more easily um, so that we don't get that last minute call, oh, the patient left the referral at home. Um, can you fax another one through? So this just raises the issue that what is e-health? Everybody thinks that the My Health record is e-health. It's not. It's a component of e-health, right? The electronic health is a communication, um, and we use the term e-health and digital health interchangeably. Um, so we other things that are involved in e-health are these as uh, written here: electronic systems for clinical and administrative records. We all, I think, everybody here would be using electronic. Clinical records, anyone not? Just no, no, no shaming, just anyone using paper records here? No, it's pretty, we, we, all our surveys suggest around 95 to 98% of uh, clinical practice is recorded on, in electronic format. Secure messaging, we just talked about that. That's the Argus and referral net and those sort of things. Uh, electronic requests and results, that's, not widely used, I think. Is anyone using that to order pathology, radiology, using it online? It's not so common in Victoria. I think it's more common in other states. Um, and it's starting to happen, though. Um, electronic prescribing. Now, everybody would be writing their scripts electronically, but how many people here know that what the little barcode means when they write a script? What that is is electronic transfer of that prescription from your desktop to a computer in a server in, in the cloud, if you like. And then when that patient takes that printed script to a pharmacy, the pharmacist can barcode scan that uh, prescription and suck that information down into their system so there's less transcription errors. And that's actually happening. And most people don't know that it's actually happening already. And that's what the uh, Victorian SafeScript system is going to be based on. Um, Real-time prescription monitoring, that's that next thing I was talking about, SafeScript. We'll mention it again a bit more later on. And telehealth. And the other thing is data management within our practices for analytics of your own practice habits and trying to target certain patients and decision support uh, within, the, within the system. So where are we in the uh, 
digital records journey. So we've already established that virtually nobody here is using paper records. Uh, where we had localised records, it was fragmented. It worked well for the time uh, when we used to treat people more episodically. Um, they'd come in, we'd write a prescription, they'd have, a, have something done, and that was it. But now we've got more people with chronic disease that we're managing long term, um, life-threatening diseases uh, like cancers that we're managing long term, and we're needing to coordinate with more and more people in the health system as well. Um, so we've moved to digital records. We made the move sort of in the 90s and 2000s. And um, these have been local systems in our practices and we're way ahead of the hospitals in Victoria, which are just starting to make that same journey. But then we moved to eventually sharing digital records. And at the moment, you can see where we've estimated we are. We're not completely shared yet. But sharing is sharing with the patient, sharing with other providers, and that's where the My Health Record is starting to fill some of that space. Not all of it, but some of it. So why the My Health Record expansion program? Well, My Health Record has been in existence for over six years. Under a previous name, it was the Personally Controlled Electronic Health Record, the PCEHR which everyone found was a bit of a mouthful, and uh, also uh, was uh, immensely, uh, I suppose, unpopular because of people felt they were being forced to use it by using the EPIP. That was the only way you could get funding for certain things. So the, uh, the, there was a number of reviews as well, and they decided, uh, the government decided to change the name to the My Health Record. Up until recently, it has been opt-in, and there's been about 6 million people have opted into the system. Um, the, uh, it's, it's considered that there needs to be a critical mass for it to be useful. And so the government made the decision to make it opt out. And so by the end of the year, every Australian, no, every person known to Medicare and Department of Veterans Affairs will have a record created for them unless they choose to opt out, okay? Um, as part of this expansion, it's also more and more uh, healthcare provider organisations are being signed up as well. So at the moment, it's primarily GPs, and that's useful in some way if another GP has uploaded information and that person goes to another GP when they're on holiday or travelling or, or just couldn't get in to see somebody and they go to another practice, they may be able to access some useful information. But that's not terribly useful if it's only limited to GPs. So more and more hospitals are signing up. Um, and even, unfortunately, Victoria is a bit of a laggard in this area. Um, and we are still finding a, a, a bit of a battle to get our, uh, our hospitals signed up, but they're getting there. Um, the uh, other thing is pharmacies. They are, community pharmacies are very much getting signed up. And uh, I was at a meeting a while back where they suggested about 70% of uh, community pharmacies will be signed up by the end of the year. Uh, so that's a pretty large amount of pharmacies. And the private hospitals have also got into this sector too. So you may, if you choose to access uh, the My Health Record, you may notice that there are discharge summaries from some of the private hospitals uh, and, uh, and some of the public hospitals around. Um, hopefully they're still sending them to you as if you're the usual treating doctor, but if you are not the usual treating doctor and you haven't received the discharge summary, then you should be able to hopefully find it on the My Health Record. So the timeline, that's a, to give you the timeline. Um, so there was... Uh, Originally, it was only it was going to be till October the opt-out period, but under pressure from uh, and a bit of backlash recently, they expanded it by another month. Uh, then there's a month of reconciliation of records, um, and then a shell record is created, uh, and the record is activated um, for anyone who hasn't opted out. Right. So it'll become activated. The My Health Record becomes activated. Uh, when it's accessed by that person, as in the individual who has it, or by a healthcare provider. When a record is activated, all MBS and PBS data from the last two years 
will be moved into the record and available for view, unless you, the individual who owns that record has decided to turn off that feed, which you can do. So what does it mean for patients or consumers? So this goes through the various scenarios. So consumers can already have an active record. If they've already one of the six million, then there's nothing to do. It'll continue on. If they had a record but cancelled it sometime in the past because they didn't like the idea of it, that'll remain cancelled. A new record will not be created. If a consumer or patient does not have a record but wants one, they don't have to do anything. It'll just be created automatically. <coughs> if, however, a consumer does not have a record and does not want one, then they have to actively opt out. And they can do that by telephoning or going online. There was a bit of fuss and when it first came out and people were going uh, a bit crazy about it and it overloaded the system, but now I believe it's, uh, it's easy to do if people want to opt out. 